Hey guys, Rich here at rcm4.com. Thanks for checking out this video on the uh, FMS FW190. Uh, this particular airplane we got from uh, Banana Hobbies, I think it was around $2, $225. Um, and uh, at that price, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of airplane for the money. Um, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, kind of characteristic that comes to mind when I think of this airplane is uh, really how well it flies. And, and, it, and it really flies very, uh, very fighter-like. Uh, compared to a lot of the other um, FMS planes I've flown, this one is one of the most uh, maneuverable and, and actually one of the fastest of all of them. It, uh, it just has the feel of, of a fighter plane uh, and, and there's no doubt uh, you know, why the Germans had, had a good advantage during the war uh, because it's just, it just such a good handling airplane. Um, uh, we, we have had a lot of fun taking this thing and flying it with other FMS airplanes like you saw in the video. We fly it against a P-51 and, and, uh, and some other airplanes. And it's just a fun, fun flighter plane. Uh, it uh, it uh, handles inverted flight really well. It has a very, very fast roll rate. Uh, and it's just a really, really good uh, turning airplane. Um, uh, part of the reason for that is the, the structure that they built into this thing. Um, this is one of the, I think, kind of newer generations that has um, uh, you know, the improved um, um, clevises and horns and also has uh, two wing spars in it. So uh, the two wing spars uh, give it uh, a tremendous amount of rigidity uh, which, which you can feel in the airplane. It doesn't flex as much and you can tell that it just maneuvers and it has a real good uh, solid feel to it. Um, when I first opened this up and took it out of the box and began to build it, it, uh, it became pretty pretty obvious that this thing was going to go together pretty fast and that's another nice thing about it. Uh, in fact, I used practically no glue on it. The only glue you really need to get this thing together is, uh, is really just gluing the, uh, the uh, five guns uh, uh, that, are, that, uh, that you put on the wings and so forth. And uh, you use a little bit of contact cement for that with uh, a little bit of uh, trimming of the pins that go in, and I'll show you that in the video. Um, but, uh, but it's nice because you can actually sit down in one sitting and pretty much get this thing together. No, no, no gluing of tail fins, it all bolts together. Uh, and, uh, and it goes together quick and it's uh, really ready to go out to the field uh, 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 pretty quickly. Um, I'm real impressed overall with the detail of it. This model has uh, significantly, uh, I think, more plastic pieces than a lot of the other airplanes have. Uh, this whole canopy section and everything are separate uh, plastic parts. Uh, there's a really nice plastic opening latch plastic part up here and a nice plastic uh, spinner. Um, so everything's real nicely detailed and uh, it also has these little uh, uh, exhaust uh, uh, plastic pieces right here that just add a tremendous amount of scale detail uh, to the model. But uh, as far as uh, the way it looks, uh, I'm real happy with it. Uh, I'm very impressed by the, um, the light blue and uh, gray camo detail that they put all over this thing and the two-tone gray and there's light blue on the bottom. It just has a nice contrast and with the black up front, the black stripe uh, and the, uh, of course the yellow and black uh, uh, spinner uh, and prop, uh, it just has a, 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 a just a good contrast and a good look um, uh, to, to the whole thing. Uh, also prop and spinner detail, I'll talk about those later, but it even has the cooling fins on the, on the spinner, um, really just like the uh, real, real airplane has. Um, uh, most of this, like I said, went together very fast. Um, uh, there are a, a couple of uh, improvements, upgrades, modifications, and some information about the landing gear. Uh, the landing gear on this airplane, for me, has mostly functioned really well. Um, uh, it has nice long compression struts to it, and it has three and a half inch wheels. So if you're flying it off of grass, uh, it's a real, real good plane for that because it has such, such big wheels on it. But there are some caveats to it, and I have some suggestions and some guidance that make this thing uh, really even, even better for, uh, for flying uh, off of grass. Uh, it'll make the thing uh, um, uh, much easier to operate. It'll tighten them up because they tend to develop a little bit of play when you're operating on grass. So uh, I have some suggestions for that. Uh, again, guys, this is not a complete build of the airplane. I'm going to cover, sort of show you some of the parts that came, all the parts that came with the airplane. Uh, and then I'm going to sort of point out a couple things I like, maybe didn't like about the airplane, and then I'm going to guide you through uh, some of the building process, but uh, mostly the things that I changed or upgraded or maybe some of the things that I improved with landing gear that will give you a good flying airplane uh, off of grass. Anyway guys, without further delay, let's get on with the video. Here's the FW190 as it arrived at my doorstep in its cardboard box. Let's take a look inside. Here's the outside of the box, typical FMS packaging, no outside box damage, no inside box damage. 
Also, you can see some of the other uh, planes that FMS offers. Let's take a look inside and see how the parts look. Here's a look at the inside of the foam crate, as usual. Uh, nicely well protected, guys. Uh, it looks like it's in good shape. Let's get all the parts out and uh, see what we got. Here's the layout of all the parts that came out of the box. Overall, uh, real nice quality. Didn't see any uh, box damage at all. And uh, very, very impressed by uh, all the details. Now let me show you a closer look at a few of the items that I think really stand out. Probably the single coolest feature on this airplane is the spinner. It has these uh, fan blades mounted to them, which is a very scale detail, just like the real airplane. And uh, just like the real airplane, it was meant to keep the engine, or the motor in this case, uh, cool. It actually draws air in and blows it over the, uh, over the radial engine. Uh, anyway, you want to be careful with these things. They're a little bit, uh, look like they're a little bit brittle. You want to be careful you don't snap one off as you're uh, installing it or handling it. Anyway, really, really cool feature. Now, taking a look at the wing, one of the things that comes to my attention right away is the uh, trunnions. It looks like they have a real nice solid metal trunnion in there, and uh, it should make for everything nice and tough. Uh, you also notice that it sticks out a little bit because uh, I, don't, I don't remember the Falkwolf's exact uh, angle of the gear, but they have sort of like an 85 or an 80 degree gear that sticks out, and these, uh, this obviously simulates that angle. The other thing I'm noticing here is the uh, scale wheel in there, which looks like it's about three inches, and it's, it's obviously molded specifically for this airplane because it really looks like a, an F-190 wheel. Uh, some of the other things you know I noticed too about it is the, uh, the nice camo color they have on there, and uh, the little details like the... Uh, like the, uh, like the trim tabs that uh, say, uh, you know, don't, don't touch them and so forth like that. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, a couple other things I noticed on here. Uh, the flaps, similar to the uh, P-38 uh, Lightning uh, that FMS carries that, uh, you know, I did a review on and a video on. They're using these nice flush flaps and um, somebody's starting to paint these now. So, uh, you know, on the airplane on the P-38, they were white, but here they painted them over with the rest of the airplane. Uh, they're also starting to use this stickers type stuff to cover over any of the uh, the uh, um, the trenches where they run all the wires for the retracts and the servos and everything. And they're actually um, pretty much matching the color on it and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, pretty impressed and uh, overall looks like a real nice wing. Have the uh, aileron and the flap server already installed. Uh, also lights, of course. We have a, a light uh, uh, mounted on the wingtip, an LED that's uh, wired in uh, with the uh, aileron and uh, should be nice to see a, a light package on this airplane. Anyway, overall impressed guys, real nice detail here. Another, another nice feature they're starting to do is uh, the propellers. Uh, this is a three-bladed prop, but uh, they're giving you a spare now and uh, they're labeling it as a replacement. So uh, probably could use a couple extras, but at least they're giving you one extra prop blade now with uh, all the propellers uh, just in case you break one. Last but not least is the fuselage. I'm real impressed with this thing. It has a very nice color scheme. I'm real, real happy with what they chose to put on this airplane. Uh, it's just very contrast, contrasty with this, uh, this sort of camo, uh, light blue and gray, uh, with the black and red accents on it. Uh, really, really a sharp uh, look at airplane. Uh, they got a 4250, 580 kV uh, electric motor that's installed in the front of this thing, so it should be lots of power. I like the plastic spinner they put up front instead of leaving that foam. It's screwed into place and it's a real, real tough plastic plate up front here. And uh, this hatch opens up with a little bit of effort. You can hear, hear it snaps open like that. There's a little hinge here which isn't quite scale, but uh, anyway, it opens up nicely uh, to get into the battery compartment. There's a 65 amp uh, controller, uh, speed controller there with a BC, and you can see where the battery compartment is, a few servos in there. Uh, but definitely a nice way to put the battery in there and a nice, uh, nice compartment that, uh, that they're putting in there. Anyway, that snaps, close, uh, with, cl snaps closed with authority. You can see the pilot figure is uh, pretty uh, decently detailed. And uh, also they gave you some, uh, I'll try and zoom in here, there's some instrument detail in there that really looks sharp. Uh, there's also a little uh, overhead uh, uh, spot here to run an antenna up to the, uh, up to the rudder, I believe. Uh, anyway, very, very nice detail. Uh, some of these exhaust uh, scoops are plastic as well. The underside, you can see a servo in there where the wing bolts on and a couple of wires are going to run through. A um, couple details here about the tail. Uh, they put some cooling fins down here. 
uh, or some sorry some cooling holes to let the air come out of here and a uh, nice scale or nice detail also on the uh, on the tail wheel assembly uh, a couple things to note here that I'm pretty happy with it looks like they're starting to do this on a lot of airplanes um, is they're putting a little piece of fuel tubing around your clevis uh, so uh, as you uh, you know when you secure those things they don't come off in the past they really weren't doing that here's a little detail I think is really cool something I really haven't seen too much of uh, but it looks like they have put a little registration plate for the airplane on the back of it. Uh, very, very, very cool little detail. Uh, that uh, one of the things that you can notice. Anyway, guys, uh, overall, real happy with the uh, quality of this fuselage and the way it looks. Uh, very, very sharp. Got to give uh, FMS uh, an A plus uh, for this thing. Here's one more item I thought I would mention. Uh, FMS is really doing a good job with their manuals and uh, they're providing a, a pretty good manual that helps you get through the building process pretty good. Uh, they're getting a lot better, a lot easier to read most of these uh, manufacturers and uh, they really help you kind of get the airplane together. They're not perfect but they're getting a whole lot better and uh, these FMS manuals uh, seem uh, pretty nice. The other thing uh, that I like that they're doing is they're giving you an ESC manual. Um, in the past anytime I would have a problem with an ESC or I by mistake put a wrong setting in or something and didn't really know how to get it back, you'd have to call up the manufacturer and have them send you the manual or, you know, they'd send you a, a downloadable PDF. But uh, anyway, now it's kind of nice that they're including an ESC manual so you can, uh, you know, reprogram the thing if you need to or, uh, or if you, let's say you, you, you crash the plane, you want to use the ESC for another airplane, now you have the manual to do it with. Anyway, thumbs up for uh, including this manual with the airplane. Here's a feature that's definitely worth mentioning. It's something I, I haven't really seen many of these, but uh, as I attach the horn and the rod to, to the flap servo, uh, I noticed that uh, my uh, flap horn, or my flap horn, servo horn, uh, was not actually all the way on the servo. It was actually kind of on an, at, at an angle. It was actually crooked, and the screw was only turned like one turn, so at the factory they didn't get this one all the way in. Um, and normally you'd have to remove the servo, uh, take the servo out, uh, to get that thing screwed back in, but what I was able to do is just take my screwdriver, uh, push the horn back into place, and then with this little slot that they provided, go in through the side, grab onto the screw with the screwdriver that they get, provide with you, and then go ahead and tighten the thing up. What a nice design feature for this thing. Now you can remove your, uh, your servo horns uh, without having to take the entire servo out. All the wing servos, including the aileron, actually have this feature. Uh, the aileron you actually have to break through the decal to get in there if you need to. Uh, but anyway, got to give uh, FMS an A plus for uh, designing this into the model. Here's a real nice detail that they include with the model that uh, I thought was uh, kind of a nice touch, and it's something I've never seen before. Uh, they give you this uh, this antenna, which is uh, basically like a uh, uh, sort of a rubbery, elastic uh, type of antenna. Uh, so instead of having to find a string uh, or, or or something else. They provide this for you, and when you tie it, uh, you tie it kind of tight, so it has some spring and some give to it. And again, it's kind of like a, uh, almost like a rubber band. But uh, uh, I secured it at the end. I tied a knot, and the knot uh, was uh, kind of difficult to uh, tie without it sliding on itself. So I put a little, a couple of drops actually of, uh, of uh, uh, contact cement on it to keep it uh, secure after tying the knot. Uh, I didn't want to use um, uh, uh, CA because CA is a little brittle and uh, that may cause it to break. But uh, anyway, as you can see, you can pull this thing and it springs back into position without any kind of a, a spring or anything attached to it. But uh, anyway, it's just one of the many uh, little details that uh, kind of add up to uh, really make a nice, uh, nice complete package out of this plane. When joining the wings, here's something I've actually never seen on an airplane before. Uh, they actually took some markings, some white markings, and they marked the center point of each spar. And normally they leave this up for you to do, but and it's not really a big deal, but it's nice because you're able to insert the spar, put it in halfway without having to do any measuring, and then uh, just go ahead and put the thing, uh, put the other half on, and uh, your wing is done. Uh, again, no measuring. Don't really even need any glue to get this on. Uh, as you notice here, the wing spars are, spars are so tight in there, uh, there's a fiberglass tube actually in there, or what appears to be fiberglass, and these spars fit in there nice and tight. So anyway, another, uh, another nice design feature that they put into this model. Here's a part where there was uh, actually no guidance on at all in the instructions on how to do this, but 
it's pretty much a no-brainer. Um, all the wires from the from the um, right side of the airplane and the left side of the airplane come together here in the center and you push them all through. So um, you just really have to basically take all these connectors, these Y harnesses, and put them together. And uh, as you can see here, uh, channel one, which is the aileron, if you just match up the wires, you're just Y harnessing uh, the ailerons together, which is number one. Uh, and then channel six, which is the flaps, you're just Y harnessing the flaps together. Uh, and then uh, you're gonna go ahead and take this one, which is channel five, into the gear, which is channel five gear, and they label, they put both labels on it, which is nice, channel five and gear. Uh, those Y harness together. Uh, and then you have uh, this one here, which is uh, a triple Y harness, actually. And uh, this is uh, channel two, which is actually gonna be the elevator. So what they did is they put the lights uh, into the uh, elevator is, is what's going on here. And then the elevator is supposed to plug into here. Now they did this in case you are flying, you know, just a six channel, if you only have a six channel radio and you don't have spare channels to plug it into. So if you have spare channels, you don't need to even use this at all. You know, your elevator can go, your elevator servo that comes from back can go straight into the, uh, into the um, uh, receiver. And then you can take these uh, channel twos if you want, just plug them into some spare ports if you want to. But either or, uh, this does everything. Everything just Y harnesses together and then you just push everything down that hole before putting on the centerpiece. Here's a look at some of the wires going into the uh, receiver, and uh, I did make a small change to it that I would recommend, and it's something that I did do to my model, um, and uh, I, I think it's a real good and probably a much safer way to put this thing together. But uh, this line right here, this wire, goes into the elevator channel, and this comes straight off of the elevator servo. Um, what they give you is this uh, triple Y harness right here, okay? And they intended for this elevator wire to plug into this triple Y harness, and go down and plug into the elevator, and then these two these two the, these two jacks of the triple Y harness to have the two um, lights go into. What I did instead, instead of running my elevator into this triple Y harness, which uses this kind of thin and spindly wire, instead of plugging it into this and then going into the elevator channel, I reversed it around a little bit. I t instead of plugging the elevator servo into this triple Y harness, I took my elevator servo and I went straight into the elevator channel. The elevator's pretty critical surface. It's probably not an idea, not a good idea running it through uh, uh, this triple Y harness, which I consider to be sort of a weak link. I just run that elevator servo straight into the elevator channel. Then I use this triple Y harness uh, to plug in my lights and plug in the rudder into the third one um, because uh, the rudder's not nearly as critical for flying the airplane as the, uh, as the elevator is. And then this whole triple harness, I went ahead and just plugged into the rudder channel, okay? So you got your rudder channel going through the triple harness instead of the elevator, and your elevator uh, servo plugs directly into the receiver. I think that's the best and probably safest way uh, to wire this thing, like I said, instead of using this, uh, this triple Y harness for your elevator, which again, I think is kind of a weak link. Um, you, if you have other channels, we only have six channels on this receiver, but uh, if you have additional channels, seven, eight, nine uh, um, uh, channels in your, in your receiver, and you have extra ports, by all means, plug your rudder right into the rudder port as well, along with the elevator, into the elevator port, and that's really the best way to go. But if you're limited on the receivers, or limited on your ports in your receiver, I would recommend running your elevator servo straight into your elevator channel instead of through this triple harness. To set up the servo and battery compartment area, uh, it was real important, and in most cases it is important, to try and separate your uh, power wires that come from your battery from your receivers. Now you can see I have the primary receiver uh, down in the bottom. Uh, you could really tack that uh, uh, anywhere you want with Velcro. Uh, I choose to just put it right down in there and it seems to sit in there nicely. The satellite receiver, I went ahead and you can see I double-sided Velcroed it uh, onto this side. Uh, and all those wires are free and clear and they're far enough away from servos and power wires. Uh, and you can notice here on the other side, what I did is I took this piece of Velcro and I Velcroed it, this Velcro down to the bottom here. And now I run all my power wires, I cut a little notch of the foam here, and I run my power wires through this side. Uh, and you can see here, I can go ahead and uh, secure those wires on that side. So it helps keep uh, your receiver, uh, one good receiver and your other uh, main receiver down in there, and keeps your power wires really far away uh, from anything inside here. And uh, you can Velcro those and you don't have to worry about uh, the two of them get confu getting uh, in conflict. Uh, if you don't know, uh, some of the power wires, if you run power wires uh, near uh, receiver antennas, uh, you can lose signal and your airplane will go flying away. So anyway, there's how I set mine up. Everything closes up really nicely. 
and uh, the interior has uh, functioned well for me uh, this way. Here's a suggestion that I have for the horns. Uh, the horns on this they give you are nice and big and they're translucent. Uh, they put four screws in the horn end, as you can see here, but on the back plate they only put two, which is really all you need. Uh, however, I've found often when mounting these things with only two screws that uh, they tend to rock at a diagonal side to side in the foam. And uh, in this airplane, uh, a couple nice features they did is they put a large screw in the front and gave you a short screw for the back. And that's for all the surfaces, ailerons, flaps, elevator, and rudder. So they really put a lot of thought into it. But what I found is just taking a hand drill and uh, putting an extra hole in here and an extra hole in here. Uh, and they give you a lot of spare screws with this airplane, which is kind of nice. What you can do is you can go ahead and actually put four screws in this thing and uh, make the whole thing tougher. As you can see from uh, the back shot here, um, uh, I went ahead and used the extra screws they gave me and was able to just drill extra holes with a hand drill and uh, fill this all, all in. Now you have a nice uh, solid uh, horn and you don't have to worry about it rocking uh, side to side. Anyway, wherever you can, if you have the spare screws, it doesn't hurt to put all four of them in there. As I was putting my propeller together, I found that uh, this pin right here would not fit into this hole. Uh, no matter how hard I tried to sort of push it in there, it really wouldn't fit. So um, what I found worked really well was using a drill bit that is approximately the same size as the pin, and you can kind of line it up. This was a number 44 drill bit, actually. But uh, anyway, I found that by just twisting it in here a little bit and just widening the hole, and you can see it just uh, makes it a little bit bigger. Now you should be able to put it in here and it fits down in there really nice. Now you can go ahead and put your two screws in. When installing your uh, guns on the airplane, uh, they all went on pretty much just the way the instructions said, with the exception of the two uh, inboard guns. Uh, the inboard guns, I found um, what was going on there is there's a uh, as you can see here, there's a spar in this slot that runs right along here. And uh, these things, these little pointy edges, or used to be pointy anyway, they sort of push inward this way. So they push from the front and they go towards the back to fit in. And what was happening was, is these pointy edges right here were hitting that uh, spar and these were not, this thing was, was not going all the way in. So what you have to do really is just take some flush cutters or diagonal cutters or, or a hobby knife or something and just kind of trim these off as much as you need to and then they'll fit as you can see here they'll fit on uh, nice and flush and they'll go on well the other thing too is uh, just to kind of keep these things from getting messy uh, it's not a bad idea really to uh, you know apply some of the uh, contact cement on here and then just take a brush and just sort of brush it on lightly uh, just so you don't doesn't glob all over the place if you get too much on this and you apply it just from the tube a lot of times what will happen you'll put this on and it'll ooze all out and it really makes a mess of the paint uh, when you do that. So if you use a brush to put it on there, you'll avoid a lot of that mess. In addition to adding the guns, uh, one thing that you can do uh, to really clean up uh, the bottom of the airplane and take away uh, some of the things that make it look like a model uh, and turn it into a, a more realistic looking model uh, is to take uh, a little bit of paint and, uh, and uh, paint a lot of the uh, the, the black uh, uh, edges that actually glue onto the wing, that part of the gun detail. Um, uh, as you see from this picture, you can look at the guns, you can look at the landing gear, you can look at the linkages. And uh, by using a little bit of airbrush work, uh, I used uh, Tamiya's light blue XF23, uh, which is a pretty close match. You can take uh, uh, the underside of the airplane in this view here, and you can turn it into this and here you can see all of those little details have just been airbrushed over and uh, it really takes away the black plastic pieces and the things that give it a uh, sort of a toy like appearance and uh, really turn the model into a much more uh, realistic uh, airplane. The FMS FW190 has some of the nicest landing gear uh, I think I've ever seen on a, on a Fock Wolf on a model. Uh, they got the shape of it right, they got the detail of it right, uh, the doors and the wheels uh, all look very scale, very realistic. Um, if you're flying off of pavement, you're not going to have uh, too much trouble with this gear. 
if you're flying off grass like a lot of us do, uh, the gear does tend to loosen up a little bit, and uh, I have a couple of fixes for that. Uh, first and foremost, what does happen too uh, when you're on grass is that uh, right here you can see that there's a very low ground clearance from the uh, wheel door um, uh, to the grass, and the taller the grass you're on, the worse this is. Uh, and there is some compression to the gears, and you can see right down here, uh, there is, uh, these things are spring-loaded, so right here you can see that, that this, uh, the gears do compress a bit. So, and when they compress, this, uh, this uh, maybe uh, three-quarters of an inch or so gets even tighter. And uh, especially if you get yourself into a bouncing-type landing, an oscillation of some kind, uh, you can see that this corner right here uh, of, the, uh, of the gear door will tend to snag on the grass, and it'll tear this lower section of the gear door off right where you see these two screws right here. So uh, I do have a fix for that. Uh, the other issue that comes up is uh, with all the drag and, and uh, bumpiness of grass, the wheels themselves, uh, the toe, uh, they tend to loosen up and the, the, the toe goes in and out and you get a lot of rotational play on the, uh, on the landing gear strut itself. So, and uh, I, got a, I got a fix to, to clean that up. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we had a couple issues with our electric gear. I'm still using my stock gear and it seems to be working okay, uh, but I have a couple of uh, uh, solutions and some information on that. Uh, anyway, the following clips will outline uh, some of these uh, gear modifications. Here's a highly recommended upgrade for the uh, FW190. Uh, our plane, uh, you can see the lower part of the, uh, of the uh, wheel door uh, broke off. And uh, I've noticed that uh, a couple other guys at the field have the same kind of problem with theirs. And you can see where these two screws are. It's a little bit weak right there. And uh, sometimes uh, that wheel pan can strike the grass that's standing up and uh, just literally tear it off. You can see right here at this screw. So uh, anyway, to avoid that, what you can do beforehand, uh, it's a real easy thing to do, is uh, you know when you first get your airplane, you can go ahead and take a, a carbon fiber rod or um, you know, just a strip of carbon fiber or like what I used is just a, a piece of uh, 256 or metric rod of some kind and uh, just cut a length of it. Mine's about two to three inches long and uh, just simply CA it okay, right onto the uh, uh, right uh, in the middle or put the middle of it I should say right where the screw is and that'll strengthen it so you know if you do have any striking with it uh, it strongly uh, supports and braces uh, uh, the joint where it would normally break out. You could even put one on the other side if you wanted to. Um, but uh, anyway, this greatly uh, increases the strength and will prevent your gear door from uh, breaking at that spot. After test flying the model over the course of uh, the last uh, couple of weeks, I have found that the uh, metal spar or the uh, 256 rod that I put right here uh, has been pretty successful in keeping the, the gear door from breaking uh, right at this joint and right where those uh, screws come in. Um, I also made it disappear a little bit by using this Tamiya Light Blue, it's uh, XF23. Uh, I found this color to be a pretty darn close match, not needing to uh, mix any colors, and it actually matches the entire underside of the surface of the plane as well, so, uh, and the sides of the fuselage as well, so it really kind of helps uh, touch up the airplane. This short video clip uh, shows you what happens when you get into a, a bouncing type landing or an oscillation. Uh, when the uh, gear doors uh, will actually, during the bouncing, will actually strike the ground. And uh, if you haven't strengthened the doors, it'll actually just tear the, the, the door, the lower part of the door right off. If you have strengthened the doors, it's so strong that it actually will cause the airplane to flip over, as you'll, as you'll see in this video. So the solution to that is actually pretty simple. In addition to strengthening the doors, it's not a bad idea to trim about a half inch or so, or whatever you need to, uh, off the uh, bottom of the door. So that will give you more clearance, more ground clearance from the grass to the door. And uh, then uh, you'll have a stronger door and, uh, and one that uh, hopefully shouldn't even, uh, shouldn't even contact the grass. Here's a look at uh, my completed landing gear and how I uh, trimmed the uh, lower part off. I trimmed about a half inch, but you can trim more or less depending on uh, the surface of, of your grass. Uh, you could see here that uh, um, I, I, this is the one that broke off in the video. It's got a crack here. I also put some washers because uh, these screw heads right here at the bottom, the bottom ones tend to pull through the plastic a little bit. Um, but uh, compared to the original door, and you can see right here what we had on there just a little while ago, um, there's really not a whole lot of clearance. You're looking at less than two centimeters at the back and uh, right around two centimeters up front. And uh, it doesn't give you a lot of clearance. If you're on pavement, you're good to go with this thing. You really shouldn't have too many many problems. But uh, but you can see, just trimming it away, 
uh, uh, does, uh, does wonders for this thing operating off grass. So you can see when I lift the tail up pretty high, uh, you have to get the nose way down, the tail up real high to even get this thing near, uh, uh, close to the grass. And again, you can trim this, uh, you know, as high or as low as you need to uh, for the grass uh, that you have. So uh, anyway, uh, kind of to, 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 to sum this up, uh, I have the extra strut back here to make this stronger that I glued in here, so it's much tougher and probably we won't ever snap this thing off. Plus I've got ground clearance here, extra ground clearance to uh, keep this thing from, from even snagging. And uh, if you cut it right, just mimic it, I used a belt sander to do this, um, you can really uh, maintain the scale appearance and make this thing uh, much more suitable for flying off of grass. The next thing I notice with this uh, landing gear is after time, especially landing on grass, that it begins to loosen up. And you can see there's a lot of play in this. Now, this is actually not nearly as bad as it can get. It can get uh, really a lot of motion side to side in this. And uh, really what's going on simply is that uh, for the most part, uh, there's a bunch of set screws all along here that, uh, you know, if you don't take the gear apart, you're never going to see that they're in there. And sometimes at the factory, they may not get uh, quite as tight as they need to be. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but also just after time landing on grass and even on pavement, uh, this will just get loose like this. So the plane will kind of steer and, and, uh, and weave all over the runway trying to take off with this. So, uh, first and foremost, you want to take four screws off of, uh, this gear door, uh, remove it and then start taking the rest of the plastic apart. With these four gear screw, uh, door screws removed, you can just take this thing off. And you go ahead and grab your uh, scissor link. This is just a dummy scissor link up here. Just pull it up and very carefully just kind of slide this plastic piece out. And uh, that begins to expose the strut. The next step is to simply remove the retaining ring or the E-ring from here, which I already clipped off, and go ahead and get your wheel off. Now, what that does is that sort of exposes one of the problems that you really couldn't see before. You can see there's actually a set screw in there that's probably either missing or it's uh, very, very loose. Uh, the next step is really just to pop this linkage off, and this is just a, a dummy linkage for uh, over center linkage that's just there for uh, appearance. And then lastly, you wanna remove this screw right here with a Phillips head screwdriver. As you can see here, after removing just five screws and one uh, E-ring, retaining ring, that was keeping the wheel on, uh, you just have the, the strut uh, completely exposed, and it's actually pretty simple. It's just a a strut with uh, some plastic stuff around it to make it look uh, scale. Uh, really quite a simple design. You got a five millimeter strut here. You have an aluminum lower strut here with a spring compressor in it. And uh, there's one screw here that, was, uh, that passes all the way through. Uh, and uh, there's one set screw here. And that's where most of the, the rotational play is coming from. So you've got this set screw causing play. You've got this screw that goes all the way through causing play, and then potentially you've got one set screw here and you've got one set screw on the other side that also could be causing play. So you wanna make sure you tighten up all of those screws. Um, I put out a video on uh, how to install set screws. If you take a look at that, that'll go into some real detail as to how to, how to set these, but with regard, and how to put those set screws in correctly. But with regards to this gear, uh, there are a couple of, uh, there's actually one specific thing uh, that's sort of unique to this model that I'm going to show you how to do. And you see, you just take the strut off, and um, you can see uh, it's really just a pretty simple strut. Now let's take a look at how to um, improve this and uh, keep it from uh, spinning around on you. Take a look at the uh, gear strut removed. Uh, again, there's really four places that uh, you can get play from. One is this set screw right here, which I found uh, actually missing in, uh, one of my, in one of the airplanes. Uh, it, it just wasn't even there, and this thing was just rotating around. Uh, the next is uh, the, the two areas here that actually plug right into the retract. And you can see they put a flat spot on there, but if those set screws are not put in correctly, um, uh, they, they can start to move too. So you may need to retighten those. And uh, I did put out a video which will address that screw uh, and this screw. The video is called How to Install Set Screws. And it basically just says to, uh, uh, you know, uh, in addition to having this flat spot in here, to uh, actually take the set screw itself and flatten the tip of it, and that'll keep things from rotating. And again, that also applies to this one back here. So that's how you secure those, and it's uh, uh, pretty darn easy to do that. The unusual thing about this plane is how they connected the two halves of the strut. And uh, what they did was is they started off with flat spots, and it looks like they intended to put set screws in both sides, but uh, it seems like they, uh, they sort of aborted that mission somewhere along the way. And uh, they decided to just take a regular screw, 
um, and this is what was actually found in there and the screw actually goes all the way through the hole that they put uh, into this uh, five millimeter strut so and as you tighten this thing up I can't really by hand get it all the way through there it actually doesn't go all the way through uh, what I did uh, and, and what it does is it, even now you can turn it and it, it, it has a little bit of play in it so um, what I did instead was is I took a separate screw and I, uh, I took this one out I put a new screw all that goes all the way through and actually passes through to the other side and then I took a nut, in particular I took a nylon lock nut, and I put it on the other side. And then I was able to tighten this side and tighten that side and sort of squeeze this whole thing together. And that seemed to eliminate all the play in this center section. So uh, that's the solution for this middle part. And if you just put flat spots uh, on your set screw here and the two set screws here, you're going to have a nice uh, tight strut and the wheel's not going to wiggle around anymore. Now the last thing you want to do to this strut that's a very, very minor issue, okay, um, and this doesn't really have anything to do with the play in the strut, but uh, you want to remove this screw, and this is the uh, sort of the slider mechanism that uh, keeps, uh, keeps this whole thing from, uh, from uh, actually coming out. It, it actually uh, leans up against the spring. Uh, what you want to do is just sort of remove that. If, it, if it's loose, just go ahead and remove the screw. And then at the very tip of it only, just put a little bit of uh, blue Loctite on it and then re-tighten it up. And that'll actually keep this thing from actually falling out of place and having your gear strut uh, fall out of the airplane. Now once you get your strut uh, almost all the way back together, uh, again, I'm going to rehash real quick. Uh, the two set screws up here at the top, uh, the one on the front, one on the back, you want to make sure that uh, there's a flat spot on the shaft, which they do at the factory, and make sure that the tip of the screw, uh, of the set screw, is actually flattened off with the Dremel tool. Uh, same thing down here at the bottom, uh, there's that set screw that went back into here, which you can't see because it's hidden by this wheel. Um, you want to make sure there's a flat on the shaft and the tip of the screw is uh, flattened off. And again, uh, if you need help doing that uh, on RC Informer, the YouTube channel, uh, I did uh, do that video on how to install set screws. It'll show you specifically how to do all that. Uh, the only other change here, uh, again, as we just talked about, was putting a screw all the way through, and here's what it looks like. Um, I went ahead and threaded it through uh, one side, and you can see it's an Allen bolt. And then on the other side, uh, I tightened it down with a nylon lock nut. Uh, and you can use, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a nylon, but uh, uh, anyway, you can see the changes to the plastic you have to make. I had to, I took a tapered reamer because it was easiest and it took only a few minutes to do. I cut a hole through here to accept the screw. I cut a hole through this side to accept the nut. And when you get your door on there, you're going to have to put a hole through there as well. Now mine was a little larger than you need to. If you use a flatter head screw than the, than the socket head screw that I used, you might be able to just uh, trim the inside without actually going all the way through, but you can see the gear door there has a hole in it. Uh, but as you reinstall this thing, uh, here I'll try and put it back on there while I'm holding the camera, uh, you can see there's a little hole in there, not a big deal. You could even paint over that if you wanted to, but again, if you use a thin head screw, um, uh, you, you may be able to get away with um, uh, not going all the way through that for those of you who are really big into scale detail. But otherwise, guys, the strut is pretty much uh, the same when you get it all back together. Now that the strut is uh, back together, you can see this is actually my completed one that I actually fly with uh, all the set screws at the top and the set screw at the bottom are nice and tight so this thing hardly rotates at all and uh, that center screw that we put in there um, is uh, nice and tight and uh, keeps the top and the bottom strut from uh, rotating. As you can see from here, it actually doesn't move hardly at all. It does move a bit and it's going to, but like it did before, it was really all over the place and the plane was uh, squirrely and it would uh, kind of, like I said, it would weave all over the runway. Now with all this stuff being tighter, uh, it almost hardly even does that now and you have a nice straight track down the runway. Here's a look at the F-190 landing gear in operation. All right, as you can see, it has a really nice smooth operation. The gear doors uh, close up real nice. This is probably the nicest uh, set of retractable landing gear on an F-190 uh, that I have seen. Let's go ahead and extend the gear. All right, very, very scale in operation. Uh, one of the things I like too is it has this little over center mechanism, although it doesn't go over center unless you push it and you don't want it to be there because it actually locks the gear up. It's uh, spring loaded to kind of keep that uh, scissor thing from opening and, or lets it, lets it uh, extend and retract as the gear opens and, and closes. Um, some of the nice features of this gear it has a real nice forward rake to it. Um, so this plane has almost no tendency to flip up on its nose when you're landing and taking off like many other warbirds do. 
Also, it has nice big scale wheels. The wheels are custom made for this airplane. Uh, I don't think there's any other airplane. It actually is a, a 190 scale gear and it's a, a wheel and it's a three and a half inch wheel. So it's uh, phenomenal for taking off uh, and landing on grass. Uh, overall, real nice landing gear system. Uh, we did run into some trouble uh, with our electric mechanism. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people have been complaining about having problems with them. Uh, what you can try if you have problems with the gear extending or retracting is to rebind your receiver possibly with your gear switch in a couple of different places. See if that helps. I'm running the original stock gear on here and I'm actually using it with a sequencer which is actually one solution that you can use and I'll show you that here in the next clip. Uh, the other solution uh, to getting this gear to work well uh, and probably they're going to be incorporating on uh, a lot of the newer uh, airplanes that are coming out is uh, a version two of the gear. Uh, they have a, a, a package with a set screws and screws and uh, a brand new version two. They're going over to uh, this RC lander style, which I think is essentially all these things are. It's really just an RC landing gear with a couple of uh, changes. Uh, as you can see, uh, the gear unit uh, looks pretty much the same. It's the same height, width, dimensions, and everything uh, with the following changes. You can see there's a custom top plate on there that they designed for this thing, so it matches the holes. Uh, you do have to uh, make a slight uh, cut in the mounting uh, on the uh, airplane itself using a, um, a Dremel tool, which is real easy to do. Probably future models will incorporate that, but you have to make a little space uh, for this little notch here. Uh, and the instructions will talk you through that because it comes with all the instructions for it. But as you can see here, the holes are just slightly different, uh, and the top plate is custom. Uh, there's also a, a metal trunnion in the new one. You can see here it says uh, PZ version 2. Uh, and uh, it has holes down here uh, as opposed to uh, being up uh, at a higher uh, level where you actually can screw them into the side on the uh, stock one. So uh, slightly different position uh, of the set screws. You're going to have to redo the flat spots also in the uh, struts themselves. Uh, the instructions don't show you that, but it's a pretty easy, uh, easy thing to do. You also go from uh, two millimeter set screws in the stock gear to one and a half millimeter set screws that uh, go into these things. As you can see from this shot right here, they do give you instructions that uh, sort of walk you through the entire uh, installation and uh, it's a nice little uh, package. Uh, again, probably they'll be including uh, these version 2's uh, with uh, you know future uh, 190's, but uh, if you're running into gear problems, uh, this is probably what you're going to need uh, to get it going. Taking a look at the top side of the airplane here, you can see the uh, gear uh, door sequencer that I used uh, to get my uh, version 1 of the landing gear to work. Um, this is originally intended for uh, separate landing gear doors and wheels uh, retracts to get uh, both of them to open in sequence. Uh, but for some reason, it does seem to fool the old style gear here into working. Uh, normally, uh, you'd have a Y harness plugged into this side uh, that would go into both the doors. And this side, as it is right here, has a Y harness that goes down one to each retract. Uh, and then this side would plug right into your uh, receiver. So uh, when you uh, uh, retract the landing gear, the doors will come, or the uh, landing gear would come up, and then uh, the doors would uh, close. And vice versa, you put the landing gear down, the doors open first, and then the uh, landing gear comes down. Um, now, obviously, we don't have a second set of uh, gear doors uh, on this airplane, uh, but for some reason, this sequencer works uh, to get the uh, version one uh, 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 landing gear to work, or version one landing gear to work. Uh, the only difference is you just don't plug in uh, this, uh, these three separate, uh, you don't plug anything into the uh, door side of this thing. You do want to make sure if you use one of these um, to, use, to get your landing gear to work, you want to make sure you do wrap this in some electrical tape or something to insulate these uh, three prongs. But anyway, here's yet another solution for getting the uh, version 1 landing gear uh, retracts to work. As far as batteries go for the 190, you can pretty much run the gambit, guys. I, I flew this airplane uh, from batteries as small as this actual 2650. 40C pack all the way up to this uh, 4,000 milliamp uh, 20 to 30C pack. Uh, there's different, uh, obviously different weights and different lengths and, and so forth of these. I ran 3,000 packs. I ran uh, 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 3,300, 36 packs, and uh, pretty much whatever you want to put in this airplane, uh, it will carry. Just make sure you use the center gravity that they outline in the uh, instruction manual. But uh, obviously, the larger battery, the heavier battery, uh, will shift the center gravity a little bit farther forward. Uh, and also with a larger battery, you'll get more flight time, uh, and you'll also increase the landing load on the landing gear. So you just want to be careful when you're landing with a heavier battery. It does tend to do a little more abuse uh, on the landing gear, so you just have to take it easy with that. But anyway, the nice thing about this airplane is even using a heavier battery for longer flight times, 
um, um, this airplane will accommodate it even with a little bit of forward shift in uh, center gravity. As you can see, the smaller battery fits in there real nice. And there's a little wall right here on the hatch that helps keep it in place. Uh, the smaller batteries do tend to shift a little bit, so you'll probably want to put a foam block in there to help that wall uh, keep this thing from uh, shifting uh, farther aft. Uh, as you can see with the larger battery here, it does fit in there as well. Um, and when you push it in, it bottoms out a lot quicker. And uh, you really don't need a foam block in this case. This wall will kind of stop right there and keep this thing from, uh, from shifting around. But uh, definitely uh, you do not want um, uh, the batteries uh, shifting around while you're flying. But uh, uh, to get this larger battery to fit into place, you do need to shave along the sides of this a little bit. And what I did was took some 80 grit sandpaper and uh, put it on a couple of different shapes of blocks. And uh, what you can do is just uh, kind of put, put it in there nicely and just sort of shave the inside or the inside side walls down uh, with a shorter uh, block like this one. You can get this thing all the way in there and just very carefully. You only need to shave maybe a millimeter or two of foam from each side, uh, depending on your battery side uh, size. But uh, but the, the block will fit in there. Uh, uh, real nicely. Now, depending on what kind of uh, adapters you have, um, uh, what my airplane came with, and they may be changing these around a little bit, is uh, mine came with a set of Deans. Uh, and I do have some older batteries that have uh, Deans connectors on them. A lot of the batteries I get do have these red connectors, so I just made an adapter, and that's what you can do uh, with your batteries. And, and so if you have a battery uh, with Deans, you can just plug them right in. Uh, if you need to make an adapter and you have red ones also, or you know the yellow ones or whatever, the blue ones that you have, you can now uh, plug it right in there and uh, pretty much use uh, almost any battery you want. But uh, for the most part, guys, uh, uh, the point is, is that uh, this plane is such a good flyer and it will accommodate uh, nearly any size battery if you want something small for shorter flights um, uh, and less weight or something larger uh, that um, uh, will let you fly for longer flight times. Uh, either way, this plane will carry a multitude of different batteries. All right, guys, that concludes this video on the uh, FMS FW190 uh, from uh, Banana Hobbies. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for watching the video. hope you all found it informative. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed flying this airplane. It's, it's just a lot of fun. It has great detail. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it builds well. Uh, pretty, much, uh, pretty much a real nice package for the money. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, once again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.